to switch gears a little bit and touch on um, the nine element plan, recognizing that we've gone over. Um, but I, you know, as everyone's aware, Department of State uh, awarded a local waterfront revitalization um, plan award um, to the town of Skinny Atlas in 2018. Uh, Kate is here from Department of State. Um, <coughs> We have been involved as this uh, award has happened to prior to uh, really getting going on the project. We've been involved in helping out with the monitoring work um, by working closely with UFI and SLA and the town and the county on their monitoring work to make sure that all of the data that has been collected, um, like our data, is part of a quality assurance project plan run in an ELAP lab because um, those are requirements for any data that's used for modeling work or for a nine element plan. Um, so those two are those are very important to us. Um, all the data that DEC collects is, is um, to that standard, um, and we're also excited that a lot of the data that's been collected over the last couple of years meets that standard as well. Um, we funded a trend and gap analysis, um, which is being reviewed by DEC currently um, to identify data gaps for the modeling work, which um, Dave and Tony will talk about in a second. Um, and we also uh, just awarded a modeling contract um, to do that work, which again, Dave and Tony will touch on. And I just want to highlight, you know, Skinny Out Slate was part of the Governor's Habs initiative. Um, one of the priority projects, the priority one projects, um, which are the high priority short term projects, was the first one listed in the Habs action plan for Skinny Out Slate, was to develop a nine element plan with a water quality model for the lake and watershed to help better understand HABs. And all of the data that DEC is collecting um, not only helps us understand uh, HABs in, in lake systems, not just in the Finger Lakes, but statewide, but all of this data will directly be utilized in, in these models. Um, and we're really excited about that. Amy, if I could just interject, I wanted to also you know, thank Kathy Bertucci for all her uh, help, help in the process uh, of the nine element plan working hard over the years for this, so thanks. Tony. Thanks, Amy. It's, it's, um, again, my name is Tony Alarm, folks. Um, I'm a project manager with the Brian and Deer for Ramble. Um, I'll be uh, kind of coordinating on behalf of uh, EC the overall modeling effort that will include um, watershed and uh, in, in lake efforts. Um, it's certainly humbling to hear about all the great work going on here today. And I think we look forward to kind of opening our arms up and trying to get our arms around all this data and the great work that everybody's doing here, working collaboratively with everybody and, um, and using all the great data to both um, calibrate, but then also, you know, test and verify um, the models that, that we hope to uh, bring back to the group. All right, so I'll, I'll speak quickly here about uh, the watershed modeling effort uh, that our uh, Chelsea Bowles uh, can be here today. I'll cover her piece quickly and then turn it over to Dave to talk about the, the in-lake piece, all right? Um, so for the, the watershed modeling component, we're gonna be using a, what's called a soil and water assessment tool. It's a uh, widely uh, utilized embedded uh, um, watershed uh, physical process model. Um, so essentially how it works, you know, we, we can simulate a variety of uh, important aspects in the watershed, uh, nutrient processes, land management, in hydrology, um, again, the physical process-based uh, framework to ultimately um, evaluate fluxes. Okay, so how does it work? Again, it's fairly straightforward. Oh, it's a fairly complex model, but, but uh, superficially anyway, fairly straightforward. The model can account for uh, land management practices. So we'll use observational data, uh, survey data, other, uh, other sources of information, working with folks on the ground. Uh, to account for uh, land management practices, not only agricultural ones, but also uh, natural, you know, more natural systems. Account for uh, precipitation, temperature, <coughs> physical properties of wide variety. Ultimately, those, those different features are brought together in what are called uh, hydrologic response uh, units of a basic modeling unit, out of which we can get, again, um, <coughs> uh, loadings of, of nutrients, which can then be fed into the, uh, to the, to the, lake, to the lake model. Have a couple uh, overall modeling modeling approach. Um, I think as as was pointed out well earlier in the conversation between uh, Jim and Dave, uh, you know ultimately what we're trying to do here is use the models to um, to to evaluate uh, scenarios, right? We get an understanding of 
of, uh, of if, if we were to do uh, one uh, management action or another on the landscape, how might this ultimately uh, uh, come to affect the, the in-lake system? Right. So, uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dave, who can uh, continue on to talk about the lake modeling side of it. All right, um, it is uh, a little premature to get in, into a lot of detail uh, about <clears throat> both the watershed and in lake modeling. The project hasn't started. Um, we have all, <laughs> a lot of things to think about. Um, but uh, that said, I think it's appropriate to um, address some of these, these issues at a very high level and, and just um, maybe instigate a little bit of discussion. So why do we model? Uh, um, why, why do we want to do this? Um, primarily, a, a model is a, is a tool that integrates <clears throat> a lot of information in a quantitative way um, that, that can help us evaluate uh, various potential management scenarios, um, such as reductions in nutrient loading, uh, the effects of invasive species, the effects of climate change on, on a system. And, and these are ways that models are, are commonly used. Um, a model is also necessary, <clears throat> excuse me, to support um, the nine element plan. And, um, and these models have, have regulatory requirements. So they have to be calibrated and tested with lab data run in an ELAP certified laboratory. Um, the model has to have a state approved quality assurance plan. And it also has to be a widely used off the shelf, if you will, <clears throat> tool rather than a proprietary model. Um, a practical benefit of modeling is that by going through this process, it enables some um, potential funding for improvements in the water. So uh, any in-lake model is going to be able to simulate temperature, mm -hmm. stratification, the movement of water. Um, there are questions about dimensionality, whether you need a one, two, or three dimensional model. And a lot of that depends upon the types of questions you're trying to answer and the data that you have to support uh, that dimensionality. Um, Commonly, models are used to, um, to look at potential changes in trophic state. Often you have a highly productive eutrophic lake. Um, you want to make improvements to a wastewater treatment plan or to non-point source nutrient loading. And you want to know how the lake is likely to respond. And in, in those instances, we're usually pretty happy with summer average type values. Um, rarely have, late, have models been used to address um, HAP, something that works on this um, finer time and spatial scale. Um, so that's something we have to think um, about as we move forward. Models have a lot of advanced capabilities that have been used most often in academic work um, rather than in um, regulatory or, or, or management scenarios. Um, however, we are able to, to model things like the, the, the effects of presented muscles, um, their filtering effects and their nutrient recycling effects. Um, we also have the capability to look at phytoplankton speciation, to look at how um, we may, we may um, move from green, from diatoms to greens to, to blue-greens through the season and why. Um, perhaps we can look at sediment flux if it looks like it's important. Models commonly do that. We can also look at the impacts of macrophytes as well. Uh, this is a, a grid from some work we did a number of years ago on Skinny Atlas Lake. This is a grid for um, two-dimensional model, C equal W2. It was developed by the Army Corps of Engineers, currently maintained 
oddly enough, both Levi, the Army Corps of Engineers and, and Portland State University. It's a very widely used model. It's uh, really well designed for long, narrow systems. It's used often on um, reservoirs, for examples, that may have, for example, they may have a, big, a similar configuration. And um, the number of um, grids moving north to south and depth is variable and again would be tuned to the questions that we're trying to answer. Uh, models are data hungry beasts um, for sure um, and uh, the more data you have to calibrate and test your model in general the better the performance will be. Um, obviously you need pretty good faith of bathymetric data in order for the, the physics to work. Um, you need measurements of inflows, outflows, and the water elevations so you can uh, develop a, a flow budget. Um, you need, if, you, if you have it, site-specific uh, MET data is, is important. And you need to know um, the temperatures of the inflowing streams so you know what their fate is in the water column. Uh, loading is critical, external loading from streams. However, um, in this case, we may also want to consider internal loading, um, whether it be from sediment disturbance or mussels, etc. Uh, obviously, you need water quality measurements, various parameters at various depths within the lake and uh, throughout the year. Really helps to have uh, vertically detailed profiles, whether it be from um, casts from a, a CTD like a, a seabird, or a profiling buoy, um, uh, or high frequency measurements from uh, a platform like the USGS has deployed. Um, and finally, if we're going to model phytoplankton speciation, we need to have some measurements, and thankfully. Um, that has been made much easier with the, uh, the advent of instruments like the, the floral probe. So I'm going to talk briefly about some, some potential data gaps. Some of these we know are gaps. Some of these we suspect may be gaps. Um, firstly, um, we need to understand the, the, the coverage um, and density of presented muzzles in the lake so we can model their potential impacts. Um, sure would help to have some actual uh, phytoplankton and some zooplankton uh, enumeration done, um, critical input to the model. Macrophyte coverage, I suspect we're in better shape there than I may know from, from the work that Bill and Bob have done over the years. We definitely do need to check uh, the bathymetry we have to, to make sure that it's it's accurate and, and hasn't changed. Um, and finally, really important that we continue the tributary monitoring efforts. Um, loading uh, is always uncertain, and the only way to uh, improve upon that is with uh, more data. Um, so just to finish up, this um, I made this slide, you're not supposed to read it, um, but it's just, uh, it outlines all of the monitoring on the left side, whether it's our high frequency monitoring, our discrete water quality chemistry samples, or our field measurements, and all of our main uh, programs here up on the top, including the four uh, advanced HABs monitoring uh, approaches, CSLAP, Winter, Lemno, and some of our other DEC monitoring programs. Um, and I just wanted to use this to highlight how much data collection that has been going on um, throughout the last few years um, and how much we continue to collect. Um, and again, all of our data is publicly available. It's all ELAP certified if, if for chemistry sampling and it's all under a, an approved quality assurance project plan or quality assurance management plan. Um, so all of our data, all of DEC's data, are available to use in the Nine Alpha Plan modeling and just for anybody who is interested in utilizing our data um, to, again, better understand some of the water quality conditions in Skinny Atlas. So uh, next steps, uh, tomorrow actually, uh, DEC and USGS will be convening in Troy at the USGS facility to talk through 
our four approaches um, as part of the advanced tabs monitoring to really take a look at the data, what did we collect um, under all four objectives, um, what did we want to get out of it, what type of outputs, and then how are we going to analyze the data, um, including post calibration, QA, QC, and all that uh, nitty gritty fun stuff. Um, we plan to continue working with the skinny out stakeholders, um, you know, in the interim as well as on the long term, both on the modeling work um, and just keeping them, keeping all of you up to date on DEC's monitoring activities. Um, you know, what, where we're going, uh, you know, what the data needs are, how can we help fill those data gaps, um, and if there's any reporting or outputs that we can do to um, to help. Uh, we plan to continue moving forward with the nine element plan modeling. Um, that, that should be kick-started awfully soon, as well as uh, the 9D plan um, that Kathy is managing with the Department of State. Um, and then we're really excited to see the platform installed again sometime this spring, so we'll have that platform out again this year, this summer, to get even more data. Um, so we've collected a lot of data. Uh, we're starting to get into the, the, the big lift of analyzing it and figuring out what it all means, um, but we're really excited um, to continue to analyze that data, work with you guys, and then of course uh, collect additional data. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Amy.